and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the festive and fun podcast where every season we select six, mostly bad, movies all related to a single theme. And then on each episode, we take one of those movies and give you fun facts and movie history you can bore your friends and family with over the holidays. Once we're done filling your head with visions of sugar plums and mostly useless information about the movie, we give you a full review of the movie from start to finish to see if it's naughty or if it's nice. And more often than not, the movies we review are quite naughty. This is season 18, and the holiday music sets the stage for episode 5 of this season's theme, Christmas Time is Here, featuring a six-pack of movies that all take place in and around Christmas, but they're not what you'd call a Christmas movie. I'm Chad Cooper, and along with my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ranstall, tonight we bring you one of the most action-packed Christmas-adjacent movies ever made, Invasion USA, starring a man whose name is synonymous with the holiday season, Chuck Norris. If you're like most people, you've probably never seen this movie or even heard of this movie. And if you have seen it, then you know we're in for a heck of a good time. This movie has it all. Swamp boats suitcase bombs, irresponsible gunplay, faces kicked in, car crashes, dive bars, surprise appearances of hookers, bricks of cocaine. It's like they took my childhood memories of Christmas and put it on the silver screen. You know what? Let's get Bowen here to tell us everything we didn't need to know about Invasion USA. And I'll meet you on the other side of this introduction with the butterfly knife that Santa left on the floor for me when I was six, a holiday bottle of Schlitz, and the never-ending hope that my dad's gonna come back this year with that pack of smokes he left to go get on Christmas Eve lo those many years ago. Dad, is that you? Dad? Chuck Norris doesn't read books. He stares them down until he gets the information he wants. Chuck Norris's calendar goes straight from March 31st to April 2nd because no one fools Chuck Norris. The only time Chuck Norris was wrong was when he thought he made a mistake. Chuck Norris can tie his shoes with his feet. Chuck Norris doesn't wear a watch. He decides what time it is. There are a million of these. Jokes all built around the notion that Chuck Norris is the toughest son of a bitch who ever lived. His face and the telltale beard appear all over the internet. Memes that reinforce his tough guy image. But who is Chuck Norris really? And is it true that it only takes him 20 minutes to watch 60 Minutes? Buckle up, ladies and gentlemen, because this is the life and times of Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris's non-actor name is Carlos Ray Norris, named after his father's minister in the town of Ryan, Oklahoma. He was the oldest of three boys, the sons of a World War II Army veteran plagued by personal demons. Ray Norris worked as a bus driver and a truck driver and occasionally a mechanic, but his real profession was drinking. He would go on binges that would last for months, creating a volatile life for his wife, Wilma, and his three sons. As a result of the domestic drama, Chuck was painfully shy. Surprisingly, he wasn't much of an athlete, nor was he scholastically adept. He described his childhood later as being a painful one, filled with financial instability and emotional instability to boot. When he was 16, his mother divorced Ray Norris, and he moved first to Prairie Ridge, Kansas, and then to Torrance, California with his mother and two brothers. At the age of 18, Norris, who had not excelled in much of anything thus far, followed his father's footsteps into the army. He was an air policeman, known as an AP, and sent to work in South Korea at the Osan Air Base. It was here that Norris's life would truly change, because it was here that Carlos Ray Norris started telling everyone to call him Chuck. Oh, and he also took up Tang Su Do, a martial art that he would eventually gain a black belt in, the highest honor in the practice. He left the army in 1962 and with his background as a cop in the army, decided he'd become a civilian cop too at his home in Torrance, California. But while he was on the waiting list for that job, Chuck Norris opened a martial arts studio and he started competing. At first, Chuck Norris lost a lot, but by 1967, he was starting to win some too, including the All-American Karate Championship hosted at Madison Square Garden. 
While he was keeping the doors open on his studio, he supplemented his income by working at Northrop, an airplane manufacturer, while also burning the midnight oil to open up some more martial arts studios. It's no wonder a guy who worked as hard as Chuck Norris and would later achieve great success came to believe that hard work was what you needed to succeed. And work hard he did. His studios would go on to train Hollywood stars like Steve McQueen, Priscilla Presley, Donnie and Marie Osmond, and Bob Barker, who would spay and neuter pets with a flurry of rabbit punches. In 1968, Chuck Norris became the professional middleweight karate champion and he would hold that title for six years against all comers. He also won the All-American Karate Championship for the second time, and after that win, Chuck Norris retired from competition at the top of his game, but not before meeting a man who would change his life. On the competition circuit, Chuck Norris met Bruce Lee. The two became friends and enjoyed training together, and it was Bruce Lee who proposed that Chuck Norris star opposite him in a film. In 1969, Chuck Norris was named Fighter of the Year by Black Belt Magazine and made his acting debut in a movie starring Dean Martin called The Wrecking Crew, notable for being the final movie in the Matt Helm series, a riff on the James Bond movies, substituting Dino for those stiff British actors, and starring Sharon Tate alongside Dean Martin. It was a small part, but Norris had a taste for movies, and his old pal Bruce Lee was poised to make him the star he always wanted to be. In 1972, Chuck Norris starred as the big bad opposite Bruce Lee in a kung fu classic called The Way of the Dragon. It made $130 million worldwide and launched Bruce Lee into international stardom. It also gave the world a look at Chuck Norris, but he would not become a star like Bruce Lee. Not yet, anyways. Steve McQueen, who trained at Norris's studio, suggested Chuck get some acting lessons. You can debate how well that went, but regardless, Chuck was getting roles in movies like The Student Teachers and Yellow Faced Tiger, aka Slaughter in San Francisco. These were mostly bit parts, and Norris spent some time putting out a book on martial arts during this formative acting period called Winning Tournament Karate, a good idea on account of how much tournament karate the guy won. In 1977, Chuck Norris got his first leading role in the low-budget movie Breaker Breaker, the story of a corrupt city entrapping semi-truck drivers. He'd actually passed on a number of martial arts films, wanting to become as big in the movie industry as he had in the karate industry by his own admission. The movie did well financially, if not critically, and Norris often said that it was his father's favorite film in all the movies Chuck Norris ever did. The next year, Norris would officially break into action star territory with Good Guys Wear Black, another indie movie Norris peddled himself. He pitched the movie to a producer saying, there are four million karate people in the country. If half of them go to see this movie, it will be a success. He was also insistent on the film being a story with karate scenes and not a bunch of karate scenes loosely tied together by a story. In the end, no one wanted to distribute Good Guys Wear Black, so the producers rented theaters and Norris toured with the movie, going town to town to sell tickets. After a year-long tour, the movie made $18 million on its $1 million budget and Chuck Norris was now a credible action star. The next year brought A Force of One, which again was released without the aid of a studio. This one made $20 million. Next came The Octagon, and now studios were interested. After that came An Eye for an Eye, then Silent Rage, a movie produced by Real Deal Studio Columbia Pictures. Then MGM released his movie Forced Vengeance, a movie with a budget of almost $5 million. No more touring town to town. Norris was on the verge of becoming the star he believed he could be. And then in 1983, Chuck Norris starred in Lone Wolf McQuaid, the story of a Texas Ranger doing battle with an arms dealer played by David Carradine. It was a massive hit, even garnering praise from critics like Pixick's favorite Roger Ebert, who said the character of J.J. McQuaid could launch a franchise. The movie notably was the first in which Norris sported a beard, and Norris later said Lone Wolf McQuaid helped break him out of the image of being only a karate star. Now he could do all kinds of action. 
The same year, he released another book, Toughen Up, The Chuck Norris Fitness System, and saw the release of a video game bearing his name, Chuck Norris Super Kicks for the Atari 2600 and ColecoVision. You know you've made it when you're on Atari. In 1984, Chuck Norris made a movie for Canon Films, a studio specializing in action and genre movies. The movie was directed by Joe Zito and was called Missing in Action, and it was a massive success. There were two sequels, and all three movies were dedicated to Norris's brother Whelan, who was killed in Vietnam in 1970. The success of Missing in Action sent Norris's star even higher, and Canon Films capitalized on this with a prequel, Missing in Action 2, and the subject of tonight's film, Invasion USA. More on that in a minute. There was Code of Silence, a non-canon effort with a bit more prestige, and then back to canon with The Delta Force, which paired him with Lee Marvin in a modernization of the Dirty Dozen idea of assembling a crack team to fight terrorists. Then there was Firewalker with Louis Gossett Jr., more sequels to Missing in Action and Delta Force, a cartoon series called Karate Commandos, both with a K, another book. Norris was now more than a star, he was an icon, an institution of the action genre. By 1990, his movies had raked in half a billion dollars. In the early 90s, he branched out into Kids Fair with sidekicks and a buddy comedy called Top Dog, featuring a woolly canine as his partner. Mental note, we should definitely take a look at Top Dog for this show. In 1993, Norris took on the role of Walker Texas Ranger, a character based on his character in Lone Wolf McQuaid. That show was a big hit, spawning TV movies and securing Norris as a television mainstay. He would parlay that success into a number of other television movies and cameos in other mainstream films like Dodgeball, where he played a judge for adult dodgeball competitions. By this point, Norris was everywhere and remained so. In the past 10 years, he's done ads for major companies, published a mobile game, written a few more books, had even more books written about him, become a meme, and that's before you count the fact that he basically invented two forms of American martial arts, American Tang Su Do and the appropriately named Chuck Norris System, or Chun Kuk Do. He's been made an honorary Marine, got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and was inducted in the Martial Arts History Museum's Hall of Fame. He seems to have lived by the code of his invented style of martial arts, Chun Kuk Do, which lists its precepts thusly. I will develop myself to the maximum of my potential in all ways. I will forget the mistakes of the past and press on to greater achievements. I will continually work at developing love, happiness, and loyalty in my family. I will look for the good in all people and make them feel worthwhile. If I have nothing good to say about a person, I will say nothing. I will always be as enthusiastic about the success of others as I am about my own. I will maintain an attitude of open-mindedness. I will maintain respect for those in authority and demonstrate this respect at all times. I will always remain loyal to my God, my country, family, and my friends. I will remain highly goal-oriented throughout my life because that positive attitude helps my family, my country, and myself. As you can imagine, he's been an outspoken Christian, an outspoken gun owner, and an outspoken Republican. You may not agree with Chuck Norris, but by God and guns, you're going to know where he stands. The introvert from Oklahoma has come a very, very long way. But what of tonight's film, Invasion USA? Why, that story is almost as good as that of Norris himself. According to the star, the idea for the movie came from the same place all good movies come from, an article in Reader's Digest. The article in question suggested that there were hundreds of terrorists running around the United States just waiting for the chance to do evil and steal the medicine of senior citizens like so many robots. Norris, ever the fantasist, wondered to himself what might happen if someone came along and organized all these terrorists running around the country and directed them to start attacking major cities. To quote Norris himself, the movie is not meant to scare people, but to make us aware of a potential problem. Armed with the spirit of nationalism and an article from Reader's Digest on his side, Norris took the idea to Canon Pictures, with whom he had just signed a six-picture deal on the heels of the success of Missing in Action. 
The movie was greenlit with a passable script and a $12 million budget. Norris had previously worked with director Joseph Zito on Missing in Action and tapped him to helm this public service announcement with lots of explosions. Zito had directed the terrific early slasher The Prowler and Friday the 13th, The Final Chapter, the fourth and best of the slasher sequels, before taking Norris back to Vietnam in Missing in Action. This would, sadly, be the last collaboration between Zito and the Bearded One thanks to a casting dispute. Norris wanted to cast Whoopi Goldberg in the role of the plucky reporter on the heels of Norris's Matt Hunter in the movie, but Zito thought she was wrong for the part. That same year, Goldberg would accept the meteor role of Miss Seeley in Steven Spielberg's The Color Purple and get an Oscar nomination for her troubles. Norris vowed never to work with Zito again, and that was a promise he kept. Despite this hang-up, Zito had some tricks up his sleeve to make Invasion USA a visual spectacle. For a scene in which a residential neighborhood is attacked, Zito purchased several houses for $7,000 apiece. The price was low thanks to the fact that these houses were slated for demolition anyway. The homes were in the path of a runway expansion for the Hartsfield-Jackson Airport outside Atlanta, so Zito and his crew could destroy them with impunity, and the results are pretty great when you see these houses go up on screen. Likewise, one of the centerpiece scenes involves a mass of destruction in a mall at Christmas. The mall filmed was in Georgia, and that wing was scheduled for remodeling and was closed down. Zito and his team of miscreants paid $250,000 to dress it up like a mall at Christmas, and then they could do whatever they wanted, and so they did. They drove jeeps through it, they blew things up, they crashed through windows, and it was real in relative movie terms. Things were going well during production, and notoriously frugal producers Menahem Golan and Yoram Globus actually called Zito on the set. Usually when those two were calling a director, it was bad news, but they loved what they saw so much in the dailies, they increased the budget of Invasion USA by another $2 million. And that money went towards building the shanty Rostov and his men explode at the beginning of the movie and also went toward paying the Department of Defense for leasing some of their tanks and personnel vehicles. Oh, and the helicopters. Speaking of the helicopters, in one scene in the film you're about to hear us yammer about, leaflets are dropped from the sky to warn citizens about an upcoming curfew. Unfortunately, there was a mix-up on set, and the blank sheets of red paper that were supposed to be dropped from the helicopters were left on the printer while actual leaflets informing citizens of a terrorism-inspired curfew were dropped on the people of Atlanta, forcing local TV and radio stations to take to the air to tell those citizens that this was for a movie and thus bullshit. No word on how it might have affected the local old coot population, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Once filming was complete, Golan and Globus leaned on the editors to get rid of all the pesky story and setup so that the movie was more of a string of action sequences. Who needs all that boring exposition, anyhow? And the work paid off. When it hit theaters, Invasion USA opened up at the top of the box office, but it fell to the bottom of the top 10 in only a couple of weeks. Still, home video was primed for a movie like this, and Invasion USA became the second highest selling home video title in MGM history. The first, why well, Gone with the Wind, of course, that other tale of civil war in the South. While Zito and Norris never worked together again, we have the result of their efforts before us on this episode. So let's get Chad in here and talk about the star of this movie, the man who forces ghosts to tell Chuck Norris stories around the campfire, and the collection of filmed explosions that calls itself a movie. Ladies and gentlemen, Hunters and Rostovs, it's 1985's Invasion USA. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to yet another episode of Pick 6 Movies. I am one of your hosts, Bo Norris. With me, as ever, Chuck Cooper. I like that you say welcome back. Like everybody's coming back for an hour and a half of nonsense. <laughs> uh, well, an hour and a half, let's be real. It's like two hours. But 
two and a half. I mean, sometimes three. <laughs> well, I'm, t- I'm counting the time when they turn it off. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> like, these guys are idiots. Yeah. All right. Well, so 23 <laughs> minutes of nonsense. But we have a very special episode this evening. Not only we do. is it a uh, Christmas adjacent film mm-hmm. as befitting uh, the theme of season 18 of course christmas time is here Mm -hmm. if you're not careful you might learn a thing or two (laughs) what is important here though is that this is to the best of my knowledge the first appearance of one charles norris on our podcast yes yes i mean obviously he's been in many other forms of entertainment sure cbs texas ranger television dramas infomercials with machines where you pull on this thing and it makes you go back up Republican conventions. I'm yeah. sure. I don't know that he's ever talked to a stool the way that <laughs> the great Clint East one did, but he definitely seems like a guy who makes his own bullets. But we are of a certain generation that grew up on movies in the eighties and nineties. And to some extent, like reruns of shows from the seventies and sixties. And this movie has a very nostalgic quality about it I, the the grain of the film stock the use of practical effects the gratuitous use of firearms to solve problems leaving a body count that staggers the imagination a quippy action hero what <laughs> <laughs> not, not in the sense of like an Arnold Schwarzenegger, but in that vein where it's not about making the audience laugh. It's about telling somebody that you're going to murder them soon. And that they can go fuck themselves without using the word fuck. Right. Similar to the movie Commando. Which came out a week after this movie would hit theaters. Which feels very right. But like that whole movie is just Schwarzenegger <laughs> telling like, I like you. I'll kill you last. I lied. I'm actually going to kill you fourth. I'm quite the jokester. Do you have a maid? If you do, I'll probably fuck her and get her pregnant. Oh no, how many children do I have now? Oh boy, I'm a real (laughs) kindergarten cop. (laughs) So, Charles Norris, Chuck to his friends, Uh is a guy that I'm not super familiar with. Like, I didn't watch a lot of of Chuck Norris movies because I thought, in fact, I, I said this to you already, but I'll share it with the good people at home. It's like if you taught white chalk karate. Yes, that's a good comparison. So I never really went hard on Chuck Norris movies. I like a good canon movie for sure. but I Who doesn't? I didn't see, like, Silent Rage is one that people keep telling me I need to see. And I never saw Lone Wolf McQuaid. You know, you named the Chuck Norris movie. I probably haven't seen it. Did you ever see that movie Sidekicks? No. Where that kid gets bullied and then he has an imaginary friend that is Chuck Norris and he teaches him karate. He like hallucinates Chuck Norris is there to be his buddy and teach him how to beat up the bullies that are making fun of him. I never saw that. You know what I saw though? A lot was Missing in Action 2. Not the first one, but the prequel set in Vietnam. And That was one of those movies that I'm pretty sure my dad had recorded off of HBO. Uh Uh-huh. And it was probably on one of those, like, super long play VHS cassettes that had, like, Uh Splash, Missing in Action 2, and Short Circuit all on the same (laughs) one. And you just throw it in and you let it go. Yeah. So, I saw Missing in Action 2 a lot. I don't know if I've... I think I have seen Missing in Action, but it wasn't nearly as good, or I just didn't see it as many times, so it just didn't seem as good. But that's really it. I think this is the first Chuck Norris movie I've ever watched, beginning to end twice. Oh, for sure. Uh, Yeah, as far as looking at it in a studious fashion. Yeah. And he's... Terrible? Yeah, he's just a cipher where I think you project the action hero you want to see on the blank (laughs) slate that is Chuck Norris, and that's how you enjoy Chuck Norris in a movie. Because he has no emotional range at all. There, we'll get to it in a bit, but there's a great scene where the script, I'm sure, said something to the effect of, you can see the weight of the decision on his face, and what you instead see is Chuck Norris looking like he may have misplaced his keys. Right, and then he just woke up, like <laughs> yeah. looking around like, where am I? Huh? But at the same time, I think we can both agree, even this early, 
this is probably the best movie we're going to watch all season. I think that the first half of this movie is the best movie we we saw this whole season. The second half, the wheels come off the bus and it goes into a ditch. The finale of this movie is absolute garbage, but the first half is fantastic. I still like the back end of this, I think, mostly because of just the real stunts, but it's about 10 minutes too long. Like this thing rings in at almost an hour 50 and that ain't right. But it <laughs> does have one of those great endings of just like, all right, we're done. Credits. And it's like, what about, oh, okay, I guess we're done here. I didn't. I they didn't turn realize. on the lights. All right, people. That's yeah. it. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Wrap it up. Let's get into this thing. I like that the movie opens with the Canon logo, so you know you're in for a good time. And I just uh -huh. want to say real quick, for anyone listening to this podcast who has not seen the documentary Electric Boogaloo, you're missing out. It, it's entertaining. It is a wacky documentary about the two guys who are behind all of the Canon films. And that documentary perfectly frames how a movie like Invasion USA could ever be made and how it was made based on the fact that Americans at that time would pay money to see it, which they did because Bo, this was the number one movie at the box office when it came out in September of 1985, right behind Agnes of God, a noir mystery in a convent involving a claim of a virgin birth leading to a dead baby. So our number one and number two movie involved God and guns because yeah. it was Reagan's America. I agree totally. Electric Boogaloo is required viewing. If you're a movie fan at all, and especially a, a fan of like action and genre movies of the 80s, you know a healthy dose of the, the Canon Pictures library. Yeah. Masters of the Universe, Over the Top. Life what Force, else is Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, any number of Death Wish movies. It's just the gamut. Superman 4. Trash. Yeah. Yeah, it's terrific. it's all just it's just a house of shit. It's yeah, so good of shit and cocaine. Those are mm -hmm. the, the two things that drove Canon Films is a healthy dose of blow and bad financial planning. I also want to point out that when this movie hit the theaters, that it was number one. The number three movie in theaters was Back to the Future. These two movies came out at the same time. And the number four movie was Teen Wolf. So Michael J. Fox starred in the number three movie and the number four movie, which is even more interesting because uh, an actor named Mark Holton, who played Chubby in Teen Wolf, he was also Francis in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, which was the fifth most popular movie for this weekend in September. So the guy who played Francis was in two of the top five movies. And then after that, Commando showed up the next week and everything just went sideways. Once Arnold Schwarzenegger showed up and was like, look, this one has Elisa Milano. I think you're going to really like it. And people did. How crazy is it that the fat guy who played Francis in Chubby was in two of the top five movies in the United States at the box office? That's insane. It's no less crazy than Chuck Norris was in the number one movie in the country. That speaks to a, a corrupt society that just don't know no better. And there were a number of times watching this movie where it was like, you know, I think Richard Lynch has a point. I'm not saying that we should burn the whole thing down, but eh, man, it's got some valid criticisms. For extra credit, Mark Holden, who played Francis, he also appeared in Leprechaun, and he was in the 2018 revival of Leprechaun. And he was also in Tim and Eric's awesome show as a character named BM Farts. See our episode on Pottersville regarding the use of silly names as a joke. Although BM Farts is a hilarious name. And that is how I am now signing my signature anytime that I'm asked to donate to the March of Dimes at my local grocery store. He also plays a mentally handicapped fellow in both of the Leprechaun movies. Not since Ernie Hudson in The Hand That Rocks the Cradle has mental deficiency been so tenderly addressed. I thought you were going to say, since Mickey Rooney and Bill, and its sequel, Bill Returns. I, I didn't think it was Bill Returns. I thought it was like Bill on the Move, or Bill... Is it just Bill Returns? Bill on his own. That's, That's what it. it was. Yeah. 
There you go. They're like, hey, Mickey Rooney, you want to make people forget about you playing that horrible Asian stereotype in Breakfast at Tiffany's? You betcha. Paying towel. What was the one with Rosie O'Donnell? Was that the other sister? No, that's uh, Juliet Lewis. Yeah, Juliet Lewis was the other sister. Rosie O'Donnell, yeah, she did one where she just, she lost it. It was like humiliating for everyone who watched it and most of all for Rosie O'Donnell. It was awful. Riding the bus with my sister. Uh Uh-huh. With Andy McDowell. Riding the bus with my other sister, right? Mm Mm-hmm. I like that Mickey Rooney one-upped the Asian stereotype and the mentally handicapped guy when, at the end of his career, they were like, hey, Mickey Rooney, do you want to play a guy who's a cancer victim against a talking pig? And he was like, absolutely. I'm the biggest star in the world. That's Babe, Pig in the City. Yeah. We gotta do that. That's a weird movie. Yeah, that's George Miller. Man, I will do a George Miller movie anytime. George Miller's great. All right, next season, Miller Time. Movies directed by people with the last name Miller. <laughs> George Miller, Babe Pig in the City, or, and also Fury Road, just to cleanse the palate. <laughs> Our movie starts off, and we are out in the ocean bow, and we get interrupted by some oversized, bold, yellow font telling us that it's a Canon Pictures production starring Chuck Norris. It's real over the top, like when a hot dog vendor puts too much French's mustard on your dog. Enough! I'm not ordering mustard with a side of hot dog. Let the dog do its thing. Mustard's a backup singer to the boiled, salty goodness of encased ground up pig lips and peckers. Also, in the same awful font, directed by Joe Zito, which lets you know, like, this is in strangely competent hands. For a canon film, the (laughs) fact that Joe Zito, unlike Toby Hooper, who just went nuts in in the canon era, Uh Joe Zito, I think, actually thrives on minimal budget, maximum cocaine. In fact, in a minute, you're going to see actual cocaine used during the filming of this movie used as a prop. Yes. On this boat is a grab bag of immigrants trying to reach America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Most of these actors look like they have addresses with zip codes that are actually in the United States. And this one kid asks in Spanish, how much to Florida? And his grandpa says, not much further. It's just over the horizon. And it sounds like that kind of bullshit that grown-ups tell kids it's like that sign in a bar that says free beer tomorrow and you're like oh great oh wait a minute they're on a boat it smells real bad they're coming to america boom 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 this kid says if they catch us will they send us back to cuba and the grandpa says they won't catch us which is based on that over the horizon bullshit remark earlier i'm not putting a lot of stock in this old man's predictions right because to be honest he would have to say no no They will certainly kill us before they ever take us back. (laughs) But instead, we've got a captain of this, you know, Uh SS nothing. Our boat's busted! Engine don't work! He's trying to fix it and just comes out of the engine hatch like... Nope, sorry. (laughs) Luckily, a big white ship shows up. Wonk, wonk. And it looks like a Coast Guard type vessel sporting the American flag. And perhaps our immigrants are saved, Bo, as we see a mystery man, as played by Richard Lynch, in a white uniform, exclaiming to these huddled masses, Welcome to the United States. And all the immigrants on the boat, they cheer, Huzzah! They have escaped the communist rule of Fidel Castro. And Richard Lynch, aka Captain Stubing, in uh-huh. the scenario uh, and later we'll learn his name is rostov he says welcome to the united states <laughs> and everyone goes fucking nuts on this boat yeah usa usa you old men let me help you out the boat and he starts to pull the guy onto the boat which is a real jerk move because instead what he does is just shoot this guy in the head at which point that must have been the signal like before they pulled up to the boat he was like okay look i'm going to have little bit of joke and then when i give you signal I want you to start shooting. Hey, boss, what's the signal going to be? Don't worry. You'll know signal when it happens. Oh, jeez, I've heard this before many times. I don't know what signal it's going to be. Kapow! Shit, that's a signal! I think it's a signal! <laughs> they just start mowing down these immigrants on this tiny SS minnow of a boat. They kill everyone. Uh huh. And then they pull some dude out of the back that they've been holding hostage. And he's like, go down, open the patch and make sure cocaine in hull. And so this guy, sure enough, opens up this hatch. There's a, a ton of cocaine, which will later be used for the filming of this movie. And credits. 
Yes, we get the title, Invasion USA, in big silver letters. And then it says, starring Richard Lynch in that French's yellow mustard font we saw earlier, which, look, we already noted that Chuck Norris is the real star of our movie, but really, Invasion USA? You're going to say that Richard Lynch is starring in this movie? Lynch has a lengthy rap sheet oh, yeah. of TV credits over on IMDb, all right? But a movie star he ain't. He is a solid villain. Nah, he's who you call when you don't have Rutger Hauer money. Uh, yeah, but this is the heyday of Rutger Hauer. Ain't nobody got R- Rutger Hauer money at this point. He's a dollar store Anthony Hopkins is what he is. He's a little bit of like an early Robert Davi where... It's that B tier kind of villain for our, mm-hmm. he's a good villain in B tier movies. So Richard Lynch, AKA Rostov, Rostov, sure enough gets second billing. And as the credits are rolling, Chad, my heart sings because we have glamour shots of Chuck Norris piloting a fan boat over the waters of the Everglades. Yeah. He's wearing this sleeveless denim shirt. It's not a vest. It's a sleeveless denim shirt. <laughs> And he's sporting this fabulous late 80s era mullet. And the credits go on way too long as we just watch Chuck Norris drive a fan boat around the Everglades of Florida. Yeah, kind of (laughs) drifting through turns and whatnot. And you also see that Chuck Norris co-wrote it, so you know it's going to be real good. Dude, he gets a screenplay credit with James Bruner who wrote Missing in Action, also starring Chuck Norris. And fun fact, the story by credits are given to James Bruner and Aaron Norris, brother to Chuck Norris, and also his stunt coordinator. They're all getting paychecks for that. Like, (laughs) I'm the star, I'm the executive producer, and I also co-wrote this. My brother's the stunt coordinator, also a co-writer, also the craft services. (laughs) I'm not sure that I want my stunt coordinator to be the driving creative force behind my movie, unless that movie is Invasion USA. Or John Wick, that's how that happened it's a bunch of stunt coordinators who were like how about if we just don't have a plot and we just have a bunch of action scenes and it turns out (laughs) it works that's what happened in jackass they're making a they've got a fourth one coming out oh somebody's gonna die making that movie and i'm (laughs) i'll watch it you know that's got to be in the writer right for the jackass movie of like hey if i die during a take that's the take you have to use for the movie we immediately go from day to night where a sedan pulls into an area with a lot of security security and we hear a guy say fbi so they just let the car in with no questions being asked and out steps agent cassidy as played by freddie jones who has one of those faces that says i'm a real asshole he played a similar role in the movie sneakers if you know that movie yeah. he's just kind of got that resting prick face where he was a former u.s intelligence agent that drank too much and got into some gambling debts and therefore was turned yeah In this case, he's just an FBI agent. He walks over to these other two nameless detectives or FBI agents. And one of them says, uh, chief, we, uh, we found a boat full of dead Cuban immigrants. They're all full of bullets. Our forensic expert is working to determine a cause of death. We're suspecting that they leapt out of an airplane to perform an aerial acrobatic show. Then every parachute failed to open and they all landed on this tiny boat which was transporting ammunition that impaled their bodies on impact. It's a bit of a stretch, but it's the only hunch we've got so far. Uh, what about the bullet holes? Well, (laughs) we think that they were falling through the air and somebody was shooting across the water at the same time. They fell through the bullets. Huh. Oh, yeah. Who else was on board? And the agent says, oh, my men, uh, curious passerbys, a couple of hobos. Also, there's a lady reporter here. And he's like, a lady reporter? That's the worst kind of reporter. What the fuck is this? Yeah. And, then- and so we get introduced to the lady reporter whose last name is McGuire. I never caught her first name. She's always snapping pictures, which I was like, is she a photographer? Is she a reporter? Which I initially I called her Peter Parker, but she looks like Parker Posey. So I just called her Peter Parker Posey. Yeah. Peter Parker Posey is like, say, get your hands off of me. I got here first thanks to a police band radio and a lead foot. Is that against the law that I was speeding through residential area? Oh, I guess it was. Um, But I got here first. That's not a ge- Oh, I guess it is. I'm, I'm on a crime scene. <laughs> you ever seen the movie Nightcrawler? Well, it's nothing like that. I didn't stage this shit and show up to take pictures of it as far as you know. She exists only to get in trouble later in the movie and then totally disappear from the goings on. She's not needed in this whatsoever. No, no, she is in one other scene, really. 
Or, well, I guess two. <laughs> anyway, we cut away from that because the movie knows that that's not where the movie is. And right. we go to Chuck Norris and his pal John Eagle, an old uh -huh. man more leather than man, yep. wrestling a gator. One presumes for both financial support and nutrition. And fun. <laughs> and fun. And they get this alligator put in this wire chicken cage. And these two muddy, hairy men just slap each other on the backs and engage in some good-natured ribbon just because they wrestled an alligator to success. Pretty much, yeah. It's majestic. And then, <laughs> Chad, we come to my favorite scene of the movie. Uh-oh. Where Rostov shows up at what can only be described as a flop house, where he is taken into a room with Billy Drago, most famous for telling Kevin Costner that his friend died screaming like a stuck Irish pig. In The Untouchables, yes. yes. And there's a woman counterpart with a butterfly knife just whipping it around to let you know she means business butterfly knives were big in the 80s oh were they ever did you ever own a butterfly knife i probably did and i lost it alongside my throwing stars and ninjutsu <laughs> magazines the fact that there were magazines geared to teach you how to be a ninja in that period blows my mind but ninjas were extremely popular do me a favor i want you to think about how many stupid people you think there are in the world right now there were that many stupid people back then that's who was buying the ninja magazines soldier of fortune remember those magazines yeah but ninja magazines i feel like were particularly geared towards dumb teenage kids particularly chubby ones like myself that in no way were ever going to be able to scale a tree or building using just a couple of crooked pieces of metal on my hands and feet full transparency i bought ninja stars in gatlinburg tennessee as a child uh -huh. had my grandfather sharpen them down to a point on some sort of device he had in a metal shop and went out in the woods and threw them at trees oh sure that's what they were for and you know yeah. <laughs> accidentally killing a squirrel or two accidentally come on well man. look let's go Oh, look at the what are you doing i'm throwing ninja stars at squirrels all right you sound like my mom <laughs> I've never felt sexier. So this arms dealer is given a phone call after Billy Drago is like, how about you impress me? Yeah. Rostov is like, look, I have a bag full of cocaine. Have a little taste. And Billy Drago calls Nico, who is an arms dealer, I think. He's a gun runner, drug dealer, something. Yeah, who just becomes a right-hand man. I don't know how any of that happens. They don't explain it. This guy, Nico, becomes the right-hand man to Rostov. Yeah. Somehow. So Billy Drago like gives him the go-ahead, like, you can go ahead and let him have the weapons. And then <laughs> Billy Drago gets super creepily close to Rostov and is like, pleasure doing business with you. And puts out his hand for a handshake. Beside Rostov, the lady with the butterfly knife is doing rails off of a mirror with this plastic, like, Coke tube. Yeah. Well, Drago, he tries the cocaine, too. He dips his pinky in it and rubs it on his gums yeah. the way that you do, right? Is that how you test cocaine? Uh, it's one of three ways, yes. There's the gums, and then I give it a little toot, and then I inject it. And if mm. all of those things get me really whacked out of my skull, it's good blow. That's how I test a new tube of toothpaste or a new flavor of cake frosting. Just a little on the gums. Oh, man. What I wouldn't give for a tub of cake frosting right now. Remember Goldie Hawn eating that frosting and death becomes her with like all four fingers just slopping it in her mouth? I do not. I need to go back and watch that movie. I only saw it one time when it's it when came she out. She gets all fat and she's just sitting in that, loud, that big recliner and she's just scraping out chocolate frosting. And then when she, she finishes one tub, she goes to the cabinet and opens it up and it's just stocked with nothing but cans of pre-made frosting oh it sounds amazing that's the, the life i want if, if i were a mortal that's all i would do is just eat cake frosting out of the tub robert zemeckis what a gem i love him speaking of gems so rostov then slams this woman's head down onto the mirror forcing the coke tube into her nose and one presumes yeah. the brain but it give, definitely rings her bell rostov goes full heath ledger joker on this woman and just smashes her head down on this cocaine straw made of metal and plunges it into her skull and then he shoots a couple of guards coming in the door 
And then, Bo. And then he shoots Billy Drago in the dick a few times for good measure. That's that's his signature move. He, yeah. he shoots people in the dick in this movie a lot. He does it more than once, yeah. And then there is a fantastic <laughs> stunt where he just takes this woman that he's already thrown a metal coat tube up her nostril. Yeah. He just throws her out the fucking window. Uh-huh. And we get the slow motion shot of this, and it is obviously richard lynch throwing this stunt woman out a window it yes is awesome and then rostov leaves yeah and like the super of this building comes upstairs in this whorehouse sneaks into the back room finds this duffel bag filled with cinder block sized bricks of cocaine picks it up and scampers off to enjoy the greatest day of his life yeah you like i mean this guy is now set for life he's gonna buy a house in boca based on this i'm gonna ask you a question about richard lynch our villain please he has a very unique look to him he has yes and i was like what's going on with mr lynch's face and it turns out that the reason he has such a unique look was that in 1967 under the influence of drugs Bo, he set himself on fire Mm -hmm. burning more than 70 percent of his entire body and this led to him spending a year in recovery which led to him giving up drugs and uh, ultimately pursuing a career in acting so if you ever watch this movie or any other richard lynch performance on say bj and the bear or buck rogers um, he was on buck rogers buck rogers or the incredible hulk i'm sure or whatever else and you're thinking hey that guy looks a little different there's a reason it's because he was burned from head to toe not unlike richard Pryor, who poured 151 proof rum on his shirt and set himself ablaze with a cigarette lighter while he was freebasing cocaine oh man drugs are great did you ever set yourself on fire? No, not intentionally and not as a result of narcotics. When I was a kid, I was melting a bunch of He-Man action figures out in the woods and a big glob of plastic burned my hand pretty bad and it hurt like hell. And later that day, I went to a Captain D's with my mom and I had to tell her because my hand was throbbing in pain. I need to put some ice on it. She got real mad at me. Yeah, sure. And mostly just because parents are like, God damn it, you know how much money I've sunk into you? <laughs> you know how much a He-Man figure cost? Yeah. There's a fire. Five ninety nine, you jackass. I have health insurance and braces <laughs> and your bed and food and clothes and you're going out into the woods and trying to set yourself on fire sorry Ugh. i met a friend in the woods i'm sending you a bill he's a grown-up like you <laughs> you what wait a second <laughs> is he like bill on his own or like a grown-up grown-up he told me there was a surprise in his pocket jesus christ Ugh, we gotta call the authorities again stay out of those woods call the police unless he's paying you <laughs> What's his name? Weinstein? All right. You might get a production <laughs> credit out of it. He said you wanted to be in movies, right? Did he take pictures? Did he give you some nice headshots? And I'm saying headshots. <laughs> anyway, kid. Your mom was progressive like that. <laughs> She was. She was woke before woke was woke. We go back to some shit that nobody cares about where John Eagle, the old man, is selling this alligator and Chuck Norris says, hey, does the social security department know about this little side business of yours? And he's like, nope, they don't know about the Vambo business either. And uh, Chuck Norris is like, I guess it's because... You haven't been profitable in 39 years. It is nice to be chums with both of you and to laugh this way. Ha 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 ha. Humor. So John Eagle's like, so Chuck Norris, you want to have dinner? And then holds up this jar of still live wriggling frogs. And Chuck Norris in a real comedic tour de force says, I am so sick of frogs. Next we cut over and we are introduced to CIA agent Adams, bling, bling, who looks, bling, 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 bling. he looks like bling, bling, the blue bling, fairy bling, bling, bling. made Gonzo the Great into a real boy. He's rowing this boat through the swamps of Florida, never advised, uh-huh. over to this shack beside the river with a swamp boat parked out beside the dock. Again, never advised. Right. And CIA Adams, he gets out of the boat and he approaches what is an extremely well-lit swamp house. And he knocks on the doors, no response. So naturally he goes inside the swamp house and there's no lights on inside. If I might, Chad, I think calling sure. a swamp house is a bit of credit where it's not due. This is uh-huh. more of a swamp shanty at best. Mm. Especially when you see this thing go up. This is not to any sort of house code. This, this right. is swamp living. 
Like, not right. since you had Wilford Brimley as Uncle Boudreaux building his <clears throat> house with a bunch of booby traps around it have we right. been treated to this level of DIY homemaking. So he goes in this house, and there's no lights on whatsoever. Although outside, there's lights everywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Inside, there's an armadillo just hanging out, and one presumes a really stale, musty odor. Maybe. And then Chuck Norris just comes out of the shadows like a vampire and puts this guy in a stranglehold and says, whatever it is, I'm not interested. I was kind of secretly hoping that this was going to be an Everglades version of Brokeback Mountain, like a tender, bittersweet, and tragic love story of two men, separate lives that once a year make their way to the swamp shack in the human humid muck of florida to finally be who they are without society judging them instead we're just gonna blow up a neighborhood later and have a shopping mall car crash scenes and a bunch of tanks this guy looks a whole lot like the rival teacher from summer school that kirstie alley was getting it on with i can't say that it was him but it sure looks like him and if you get that reference you need a colonoscopy <laughs> this cia agent says look chuck norris i'm not here to make love with you this time. The company needs you. We believe that Rostov is in the country, and by country, I mean the United States of America. You should have let me kill him when I had the chance. Now, he is your problem. <laughs> and then we cut to a mansion, or an embassy somewhere, and a bunch of cars pull up with small diplomatic flags on the front, and there are armed guards out front wearing pith helmets, so we might be in Africa, maybe the Bahamas, we might be in Miami, we might be in Adventureland over at Disney World. And outside this compound, we see Rostov creeping around in a gray onesie. And he hides in the bushes. And from a small case, he pulls what I'm guessing is like a grenade launcher or a small rocket launcher. And he sees the men from the cars inside the building talking. And they're drinking champagne from flutes. And Rostov prepares to take his shot. But then, Bo, a gun barrel appears beside Rostov's temple. And it's Chuck Norris who says, not this time. Rostov, it's time to die yeah it, which is the recurring thing like delivered by another actor this progression would be kind of fun but instead of shooting him chuck norris just kicks him in the face and knocks him out uh, and i guess he escapes or something well no rostov wakes up violently from this nightmare in this motel room that has no sheets on the bed classy right, but clearly this really happened at some point so they had he rostov might just be making it up who knows i dream about all kinds of weird shit <laughs> it's just his pre-bed masturbation fantasy when Rostov wakes up from this, uh -huh. Nico is there is like, did you have the dream again? And Rostov is, says, it is nightmare. Yeah. We need to kill Chuck Norris before the operation moves forward. Nico is Rostov's right-hand man. And when he rushes in, another guy is with him who is Screech from Saved by the Bell. And Screech is uh, Nico's right-hand man. Every bad guy in this movie has their own right-hand man. Screech's right-hand man is Toot Toot. Toot Toot's right-hand man is noodles noodles right hand man is big t big t's right hand man is little t it just goes on and on until you get to the newest henchman hired who's just waiting around for a new recruit so he can get his own right hand man or woman but it's gonna be a man he's just got a surprisingly agile raccoon yeah like a, a puppet i'm literally your right hand man but you're on my left hand shut up and nico is like you know you really need to forget this uh chuck norris guy yeah. it's just a distraction i mean you're jeopardizing the whole operation going after just one guy boss did you forget what the big plan was let's stick to it remember we're invading usa we're gonna invade the united states of america and you want to go after one guy come on boss stick to the plan look you only know chuck norris by reputation i know his work as long as Chuck Norris is breathing, he is threat. Uh, yeah, but boss, we're going to invade the entire United States of America. That's the big surprise. It's the brass ring, all right? We got a lot of, to manage, to take over, you know, the country with the largest and most heavily funded and armed military on planet Earth. We're going to get Fanboat, and we are going to drive Fanboat to Chuck Norris. Then we blow him up. Then we go on with Invasion USA. Have you ever been hit in face with basketball? That is what it feels like when Chuck Norris kicks you with his cowboy boot. That is what we are up against. As long as Chuck Norris is breathing and has legs and feet to kick you in the face, he is a threat to our mission. He's like Deadly Friend, the movie where Christy Swanson is a robot. <laughs> and... She throw basketball at men and his head explode. <laughs> that is like 
Chuck Norris <laughs> kicking me in face. Also, Deadly Friend, directed by Wes Craven. This does not make sense to me. He made A Nightmare on Elm Street, then movie about robot girl. Makes no sense. Our movie then cuts to the Swamp Shack Baby. Swamp Shack I got me an baby. armadillo. It's as big as a bread box. <laughs> and it's coming out of the Swamp Shack. Swamp Shack Baby. Swamp Shack Baby. This little armadillo is like turning over a bowl of milk and acting all cute and shit while Chuck Norris <laughs> is just chainsawing some wood for no reason. Mm -hmm. Well, he's got, you know, Chekhov's brand chainsaw. The best chainsaw that you need when you need to have your character distracted from swamp boats coming to kill you. Yeah, but he... It's not really Chekhov's chainsaw because he doesn't ever use it again. Like if he had used it. Well, that's it, because he's Chuck Norris. He's going to use his cowboy boot. He's wearing Chekhov brand cowboy boots. They just fit right. <laughs> and then our movie cuts to not one, not two, not three, Bo, but four swamp boats headed to the swamp shack, baby. And they each have a driver and at least one or two henchmen. And they've all got machine guns. And hopefully they're joking. Box money! Swamp Jack, baby, Swamp Jack! Before they can roll up on Chuck Norris, though, uh -huh. out of nowhere comes old John Eagle, and he's just like, hey, are you guys invading USA? And they're like, oh no, we need to kill all the men. But John Eagle is quick on the draw, like it's an old western like showdown. He just whips out his shotgun, ch -ch -ch boom, ch -ch boom! Right, but of course, these are Invasion USA's. And they shoot up John Eagle with machine guns, murdering him. R.I.P. John Eagle. It was nice knowing you. I really thought you were going to be around a lot longer. Yeah, yeah. I thought he was going to be a third act kill or something, but no, mm -mm. He, he goes early. Then Chuck Norris, sensing that John Eagle has been killed by machine guns, dives out the window of this place, at which point Rostov and his crew blow the ever-living shit out of this swamp shack, baby. Yes. And... It is glorious. Like, all the explosions in this movie, totally legit. That yes. is the greatest thing about Invasion USA, is when they blow shit up, they really blow shit up. It's no models. It is just honest to goodness. Let's build a shack and then blow the fuck out of it. And I am with yeah. all of this. This swamp shack blows up like the Dixie Boy truck stop. Yeah. And I like that all of the henchmen get in on the action of shooting bullets. They didn't take an hour-long swamp boat trip to not fire their own rocket launchers and grenade launchers and machine guns. They were promised that they would destroy a swamp shack and destroy a swamp shack they will. Rostov is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Nice shooting text. That is Ghostbusters reference from last year's movies. Very funny film. By the way, they should never make sequel or consider rebooting movie, whether with all female cast or younger children. Original Ghostbuster. Perfect movie. As is. Leave it alone. Just lightning in battle. No way to recap caption magic i don't know why i went on tangent also deadly friend still sticking in craw robot girlfriend it just make no sense anyway stop shooting bazooka at shanty clearly we have killed chuck norris there is no reason to confirm pieces of his body among burning debris everyone turn swamp bounce around and we will head off to continue plans of invading usa turn up b52 i like alternative tip surf <laughs> sound then we see that not only has the armadillo survived all of this so has chuck <laughs> norris he comes out and picks up the body of john eagle who got mowed down by bullets and he drags him up to the remains of the swamp shack and then chuck norris wraps john eagle's body in a blanket and then he just takes a kerosene lamp and sets his body on fire, which I don't understand why the flames from the original grenades and rocket launcher explosions went out so quickly. But this new lamp fire and the subsequent roasting of John Eagle's corpse is clearly going to be a pickle for any law enforcement officials assigned to this case, of which there will be none, Bo. Well, John Eagle was in fact a Jedi, as we see at the end of the movie when his force <laughs> ghost appears to Chuck Norris to tell him, like, use the bazooka chuck the coroner just writes down the cause of death swamp justice <laughs> viking funeral yeah <laughs> well based on the evidence i'm putting down suicide clearly chuck norris then drives the fan boat 
to the pickup truck that he keeps at John Eagle's store. I think that that's John Eagle's swamp boat and that's John Eagle's truck. Oh, maybe so. <laughs> this is the scene where he tries to act with his face and can't. Uh -huh. uh, where it's clear as he's getting into the truck, it's like, well, the weight of him stepping back into his old life and the death of his friend and all that stuff. And it's just white bread, lightly toasted across the face of one Charles <laughs> Norris. It is it, it, Poor guy. You just can't ask that much of him. I like that John Eagle keeps the keys to his truck under the wheel well. He just reaches up under, grabs them, and then off he drives. Oh, by the way, both passenger side and driver side window totally rolled down. The keys under one wheel well. There's a scorpion under the other. There's some leftover frog legs in the back left. The back right is $7 worth of silver dollars. We cut to a hot dog stand at a sub sandwich shop next to a public beach in Miami. And there's a good amount of outdoor seating in this place, and we see... Nico and Rostov making plans to invade USA. And Rostov says, Tonight we make history, Nico. America has not been invaded by a foreign enemy in over 200 years. Look at them, Nico. Soft and spineless with their decadence. They don't understand the nature of their own freedom or how we can use it against them. They are their own worst enemy, but they don't know. Boss, you, you said they don't know. It seemed like you were going to say something more there, but you just kind of trailed off. You said, but they don't know. They don't know what, boss, exactly? I was thinking about Armadillo. I wonder if Chuck Norris also survived. I see Armadillo climbing out of... Never mind, it's fine. He was blown up. <laughs> Positive. No way that both Armadillo and Chuck Norris survive. All right, it's good that you got your eye on the prize, boss. I mean, we are invading one of the top two superpowers on planet Earth with our ragtag team of idiots. But you know what? You're the man with the plan, boss. I'm behind you 100%. What could possibly go wrong, boss? You know, I also think a uh, hot dog, it, they have hot dog eating contest. It's so strange that skinny men always win. You would think big guy would be able to put away more hot dogs, but no, it is always thin men. What were you saying about the invading USA? Oh, yes, we invade USA tonight. So we cut to a man and woman swimming out in the ocean at night. Highly advise anyone to never do that. And they rush back toward the beach and they start making out as flares fire up into the sky. And this man and woman, they head over to a beach blanket where they have a portable five inch color TV playing beside them with Phyllis Diller being interviewed on the Mike Douglas show. It's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good i because i was like in the middle of this movie I, I all of a sudden i get to catch up with what fang is up to and i appreciate that and so does nico nico is really into it as well because after you know the couple is making out for some sandy sex nico rolls up and murders him but you know he, what he doesn't murder that tv because i think he's a phyllis Diller fan and it's here that the invasion usa begins as four or five higgins boats hit the beach and about like 50 to 100 armed knuckleheads all rush the shore of miami to take over america yeah i don't know what their plan is exactly or what their end game is i think they also ghostbusters and they just decided to use the old get them tactic they have a bunch of trucks waiting for them so all these people rush out of the amphibious vehicles onto uh, the beach go on. to these trucks and rostov is watching these trucks take off and start hitting the highway and he says 18 hours from now america will be different place also would be fun to spin off cosby show maybe call it different world could be set in college lisa bonnet big star she needs own vehicle. Also, oh, vehicles. Yes, we invade USA with all the trucks. Everybody, good job. You think Bin Laden watched this movie and found a little inspiration? You think he considered assassinating Chuck Norris before 9-11 because he saw how this movie ended? <laughs> kind of mucked everything up? Right. He was just like, look, no matter what happens, don't run afoul of Chuck Norris. As long as we do that, we're going to be fine. <laughs> And, uh, you know, he was right. He was right. All these knuckleheaded henchmen, they drive off in their trucks and vans to go do something. We don't know what it is. We cut to Ray's Pizza, which is open 24 hours, Bo. That's nice. And I think we're near Miami. There's a couple of whores out front calling the cops out for a suck. And CIA agent Adams, who we met earlier, he walks up and finds Chuck Norris sitting on a stool at the counter. And he's drinking a beer. And CIA agent Adams walks over to Chuck Norris. And Chuck Norris says, I'll take the assignment. 
Remember, I work alone. And then Chuck Norris walks away, leaving CIA agent Adams to pay for Chuck Norris's beer because Chuck Norris, Bo, is a smooth operator. Uh huh. And so then the cops arrive, namely our main cop, to find the dead kids on the beach as well as these boats. And he's like, hey, one of you assholes, find out who bought these boats. Contact the Department of Defense and uh, let me know who it was. And they're like, these boats are like 40 years old. I have no idea. Well, well, I guess you better get on it then, huh? Huh? Off to the side, the public is all roped off with yellow crime scene tape, and Peter Parker Posey is there, and she's snapping pictures with her camera, and she's yelling at these cops, and she's like, hey, any word for the press? What the hell happened here? You guys suck! And then she sees Chuck Norris appear out of nowhere, and she recognizes him, and she's like, hey, cowboy! And so she goes to get under the crime scene tape, and two cops actually do their jobs, and they're like, hey, you can't go over there. They're dead bodies. She's like, this is bullshit. I'm in the media. And Chuck Norris stares at her with the blank eyes of a great white shark. <laughs> And move to the next scene, which is the second best scene of the movie, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. It's a neighborhood at night, just kids biking around. They're playing in the streets. One's like rolling a hula hoop with a stick. One of them's got a lemonade stand set up out front. Weirdly, this family is decorating an outdoor Christmas tree like a bunch of weirdos. This is the first time in this movie that you're like, wait, this isn't Christmas? Oh, yeah. It only happens twice. It's here in the mall. And then they don't even mention Christmas for the rest of the time. Because it's a real war on Christmas type movie. Yeah. Well, all things American. Yeah. Yeah. Church, Christmas. Apple pie. Like they blow up an apple pie later in the movie. They do shoot bullets at kids playing baseball. Oh, sure. And (laughs) as these healthy, young, beautiful American children are playing, a couple are making out in a car. Dude, these two people making out in this car. It's parked on the side of the road. They look like they're 28 years old. It's real crazy creepy because right beside them are like you said like six kids throwing a football around and i also like that the girls going inside the guy's like hey five more minutes of like what of teasing each other and walking away with like sore ass balls from not conjugating the verb in this car it's Uh. anyway the mom calls the family in because they're arguing about who's going to put the star on the tree and the Uh kid is like hey you guys all go in for dinner i'm just gonna be out here rolling up the garden hose (laughs) Uh and then she runs up on a ladder to put the uh, star on the tree yeah but that's when rastov and nico roll up in the back of a flatbed truck and the music gets all ominous yeah And Rostov just looks over the breadth of his domain, all these Americans doing American stuff, and he says, Look at them, celebrating their Christmas. They make it so easy. (laughs) And then the grenade launching begins, and they blow the ever-living shit out of this neighborhood. Honest-to-goodness houses being exploded for our pleasure chad and i love it it is the best it's really just a more extreme version of what the grinch pulled off with way more murder and explosions (laughs) and then they like rostov and nico take off leaving behind people just battered death concussed surveying the damage somebody comes over to pick up this little girl off the lawn who put the star there's on the very little screaming or reaction from the neighbors no, everybody's too because nobody was on the set when they blew up these well, houses yeah, it's too. eerily quiet yeah. i like to believe chad it's just because nobody can quite process what has just happened like their lives have been totally uh, turned upside down in a matter of uh-huh. moments families just annihilated loved ones gone christmas has just been canceled this year for most of the people in this neighborhood oh uh, it's the best just think about any neighborhood you've been in a truck pulls up and just starts firing grenades or rockets into about what six eight houses and then drives off which that's not really an invasion usa that's just more of extreme assholery well what we learn is that this things like this are happening all over the place but we'll we'll get to that let's cut to a community center I'm guessing near Miami based on the style of music playing and the people there, they're kind of weaving in and out of English and Spanish as they talk. Two of these guys go over and they hit on a couple of women. And one of the men says, my friend thinks you are a fox. And I was like, hey, they might be a couple of wild and crazy guys, bro. And then 
<laughs> some cops show up. One of them screech. He's in a police uniform. And then there's a guy beside him who's, I think, an Asian dude in mirrored sunglasses. Yeah. And one of the guys from this Latin dance party that's happening is like, hey, I hope you were not like the asshole cops that came in the neighborhood a couple of weeks ago. And uh-huh. then these two dudes just open fire with shotguns killing yeah. people and i'm like so they're cops they don't explain that to you and they really rely on you the audience recognizing screech from earlier in costume also by the way peter parker posey is there taking pictures why oh uh-huh. <laughs> maybe this is her side hustle she was on assignment at the <laughs> latin dance party i think it's just a shift in culture because at the time it was like oh my god those police are killing those minorities and now it's like <laughs> oh yeah yeah, cops are killing minorities. Of course they are. And then when you find out, like, w- real cops show up a- after yeah. the devastation and the community, the r- survivors, like, throw rocks and shit at the car on account of them being cops that just came through and murdered a bunch of people. And then the cops take off and you're like, well, now that's an America I recognize. Real cops are gone. Fake cops have caused damage. Chaos is in starting to uh, to take root. We cut to Chuck Norris driving John Eagle's stolen pickup truck through the rough part of town bow where we see pimps and hoes out on the street and i like that there was a guy out there playing a saxophone to create some ambiance and one hooker stares down chuck norris and she says what the fuck are you looking at fuck you and bo with that kind of attitude she's not going to get the kind of business that she needs she's not going to be a successful whore he stinks like bacon, you're a sex Chad. worker i mean there is no way that he's not a cop i get that you're a sex worker but first and foremost you are in the business of sales and marketing you can't use that kind of harsh language it turns out the customers you gotta sell yourself literally yeah some bikers come out and they start beating chuck norris's truck with chains yeah where are we are we still in miami the architecture here looks like milwaukee or more than it does south beach So Chuck Norris goes into this bar displaying a prominent rebel flag. And it's also displaying a flag (laughs) with a skull and a green beret and the words, kill them all, let God sort them out. That's nice. Yeah. In modern parlance, this would be like QAnon Central. Sure. And he gets accosted by some dude who's like, hey, I don't know you. And Chuck Norris is like, well, that makes us even. I don't know you either. I'm going to step aside because I have business here with someone else. And the guy keeps giving Chuck Norris shit so chuck norris grabs this dude's hand that happens to be holding a beer bottle and uh-huh. s- squeezes it until the bottle shatters in this guy's hand at yep. which point the guy's like oh my hand and runs off uh-huh. and chuck norris goes to find this old soldier for hire that he knows apparently and he says hey there old chum where is rostov i hear he <laughs> is in the united states the guy's like oh man i i don't want any of this business and he says hey you owe me for saving your life in South America. Yeah, you got a good point. You should go to the King Cobra. There's a bunch of bad dudes there. All right. Thanks, old chum. That is where I will go. And so he takes off. We go back to the community center where all of these dead bodies are being tossed in the back of ambulances. And our main cop who's investigating every crime in the greater Miami-Dade metro area, he walks over and finds Peter Parker Posey snapping pictures. And this investigating cop slash FBI agent, I don't know what he is. He's like, he's like, trouble sure has a way of following you around don't it and i'm like whoa 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 are you saying this is my fault right like you're the spark that lit this or something (laughs) this cop says we had over 20 incidents of extreme violence here in miami last night where were you during all those simultaneously occurring incidents of extreme violence miss peter parker posey if that is your real name dude and this is where this movie started to ring a little too close to home where Uh the cop is like more violence is breaking out people are losing faith in authority And it's like, oh, yeah, right. Like modern America. Got it. Oh, yeah, that does create a hellscape. Okay, I'm with you. This is a real let's do the forensics on January 6th kind of thing. He says pretty soon they won't believe what they see in the news. They won't believe in their elected officials. And the next thing is we have an angry mob storming the capital of the United States, trying to hang the vice president for not breaking the law to overturn an election. When he failed game show host wasn't re-elected to the president of the united states of this great country the usa and i'm like wow this is quite on the nose invasion usa it's like the simpsons getting all that shit right in the future the only thing it gets wrong is that it's not an invading force from without it's actually a bunch of knuckleheads who already live here doing it (laughs) they gotta twist it they don't want to get sued (laughs) right he ripped off our movie so rostov and 
a Screech are hanging out beachside. Screech is wearing nothing but a black banana hammock showing off his big old dick. It's mirrored shades. Yeah, it's a good he look It looks pretty him. sweet. Yeah. And then Nico shows up and says, hey, I got a Christmas present for you, Screech. And Screech is like, oh boy, that sounds great. I'll take that <laughs> right off your hands. And Rostov is like, this is good. You know, it reminds me of how Grinch stole Christmas. I really like cartoon. The movie, not so much. The cartoon, very good Boris Karloff. He is good old Russian name. I like how he narrate. Fun fact, in the book, Grinch is not green, only in cartoon special. Chuck Jones make him green because he drove ugly green car. I learned that from listening to podcast called Pick Six Movies uh, during episode about Jim Carrey starring in film adaptation of cartoon. You should listen to podcast. Very funny. Also very informative as, as movie <laughs> fan. I like it. You do a little bit of a combo. We to a couple of guys washing their red convertible hoopty at night outside of a different dive bar one of them's a tall guy and the other looks to be about four feet ten inches tall and he's about four feet ten inches wide just nothing but muscles and this corvette pulls up and runs over the car washing bucket that is at the heart of their business of auto detailing three guys jump out of the corvette and they go inside the dive bar and the tall guy and the short muscle guy they scream at these three jackasses and then the two car washers decide to head in after these assholes to give them what for, Bo? There's a bit of a scrap outside, but then these dudes go indoors where this mustachio gentleman is attempting to get it on with a real cougar uh-huh. uh, who i think is also probably a sex worker not probably yeah she's clearly a prostitute so they go upstairs and she touches his hand and he gives it a real freak out like he'd been you know burning he-man figures out in the woods i know what that's like <laughs> really <The> serendipitous <laughs> that that came up on this show well the reason his hand is busted he got shot in the hand during the sequence when they blew up the love shack baby that's why he's all mangled oh okay i yeah i missed part yeah. of that well you only watched it twice so i can see how that could happen eh, you know i mean watched in quotes <laughs> it was on in the other room <laughs> yeah, i could hear most of it i turned it down <laughs> i put on the subtitles and they all left the room that's why we have interns just <laughs> right put some shit on the paper i can fake it so this <laughs> dude with the bum hand uh gets grabbed by chuck norris who takes the hand that's already injured where did chuck norris come he from lives in the shadows chad that's where he always comes from <laughs> and chuck norris stabs him in the bad hand and tells the Ugh. the cougar sex worker to take off and he says i want to know where rostov is and then kind of gives the knife a twist in this guy's hand and the thug's like i ain't gonna tell you nothing and meanwhile this other thug that was out washing cars rushes in and chuck norris kicks him out of the room and then he gives him the iconic line if you come back in here i'll hit you with so many rights you're going to beg for a left <laughs> then the dude <laughs> runs off and then chuck norris twists the knife a little bit more and the guy's like oh i ain't telling you nothing and he says you're gonna tell me what's coming down next and then this dude that chuck norris just kicked out shows up with some more thugs well he shows up with his stumpy muscled friend yeah and the whore it's the three of them ready to take this guy out or maybe go kidnap little orphan annie but not before chad apparently this dude has really given up the ghost as far as what's going down i guess so and so chuck norris then like kicks those dudes out and then gives a grenade to the informant and pulls the pin on it and he says if you live through this tell rostov it's time to die he will know what that means Oh, and tell him that message is from Chuck Norris. He knows me. We met in South America, or maybe the Bahamas. You should probably write this down. Oh, wait, you can't because of the knife in one hand and the grenade in the other. Just tell Rostov that Chuck says it's time to die. He'll know what that means, probably. And then he takes off, and the informant ultimately throws this grenade out the window after Chuck Norris leaves, which blows up the hoopty that was being washed. <laughs> yeah. In that scene, and we cut to a 1980s era mall at Christmas time for the greatest sequence of this whole movie. Everything that happens in and around this mall is pure 
cinematic gold. This should have been the finale of this movie, but they screwed up because the ending of this movie is terrible in comparison. I mean, yes, it's better than the end of the movie. If your movie involves terrorists blowing up a shopping mall at Christmas, come on, as opposed to what this thing ends with, which is kind of sort of an office building in downtown Atlanta. Yeah. No comparison. Yeah. I mean, you're not wrong. You clearly don't like the end as much as I do because I think it is a perfect canon films ending i can't disagree with that i just think that this is a better sequence than the finale because this is totally bonkers oh for sure so we're in this mall at christmas and we see this shitty kid chewing gum and looking at this nissan 4x4 with those cool yellow kc covers on the front lights it's pretty sweet bro and the security guard is standing nearby checking out this kid as the boy chews his gum and he's blowing bubbles and it's a little creepy how interested this security guard is in this young man well he is suspicious to be sure the child chewing gum next to a truck on display for purchase yeah, but he's a shifty looking kid like he's kind of eyeing the cop like it's one of those things where the mall cop's spidey sense is kicking in where he's like you know this kid keeps looking at me and then at the truck and then at me again and at the truck if i were that security guard i probably would have shot the kid well he's white though uh you know i probably still would have done it i would have said he was antifa false flag operation this kid is a piece of shit he takes the gum out of his mouth and he whips it at the windshield of this nissan truck and the security guard chases after this kid calls him a brat and then like hot on his heels and the kid runs away and here we see screech holding the bag that has a package in it that he was given earlier by nico when he was catching some rays in his black banana hammock and the package bow is beeping so either the package contains a microwave that just finished heating up some leftovers or there is a bomb inside <laughs> right it's beeping way too loud it's beep beep like a garbage truck is backing up inside this like, holiday bag and then something that would never ever happen occurs here where this couple sees that screech has left this package and they start running uh -huh. after him to give it back rather than just sir! be like free present sir sir you dropped your package sir and the guy's real insistent of giving it back like he's running full sir you dropped your package sir at one point this draws the attention of the mall cops who are also now chasing screech that man dropped his package we've got to get it back to him let's go boys and all of this pursuing of screech goes on until some of screech's accomplices show up and start shooting at the dude chasing him along with the mall cops and just about anybody else that happens to be around let's stop for a moment please screech is running away a guy's trying to bring back his package and these two hired goons it's like oh shit they're chasing him we've got to start killing people with our shotguns in this mall the logic of this is so absent it's mind-boggling that this happens well they're there to guard screech and the bomb what for no good reason right like screech was also getting away by the way he had a healthy lead yeah and just like let it go and also chad in fairness the bomb that goes off isn't all that big it like no. blows up the Santa elf waiting area, but not Santa's chair itself. It's something you could have concocted with products that you purchased at a tent stand next to the interstate around the 4th of July or New Year's Right. Day. It's like somebody just wove four or five M80 wicks together, and that's what went off, along with one of them uh, snakes. So this blows up, and at this exact moment, a separate truck crashes through the front of the mall, and it's Chuck Norris to save the day. Yeah. I need to pause the action again for a moment. Uh-huh. Was Chuck Norris outside in his truck just waiting for some shit to go down? Because he crashes into this mall extremely fast right after the bomb explodes and the gunshots and all that. So this kind of led me to believe that his arrival to save the day was just an act of extreme serendipity where he crashed into this place and it just so happened that henchmen were slaughtering holiday shop. Yeah, it's a real question mark because this happens a couple of times where Chuck Norris shows up in the nick of time. Or like out of the shadows of a whorehouse yeah he's just like the batman he is like the batman but <laughs> he ends up ramming this dude through a storefront whips out of his well john eagle's car and has twin uzis that he uses for much of the movie also yeah. big in the 80 
the Uzi in movies. Yeah. It's the it's the tiny Uzis. It's yeah. that weapon in a video game that you only use as a last resort. It's like and they're like, oh, I'm out of bullets. Shit. And Screech, meanwhile, is hot wiring this fancy truck that the kid uh, that was probably Antifa and got uh-huh. shot earlier was trying to throw gum at. Movies made hot wiring cars look real easy yeah. in the 80s. Like, you just took a couple of wires, you yanked them out, and zap, zap. I don't think it works that way. This movie also makes setting off wired bombs look really easy, as we'll learn in a little bit. But So Chuck Norris jumps on the passenger door of this truck as it passes uh-huh. by and just starts punching the guy in the passenger seat. Kudos to Chuck Norris, because this is Chuck Norris. Yeah. It's not a stuntman. It's straight up him. Well, yeah, you don't hire Chuck Norris for his acting chops. You do it because he's going to go through a window. (laughs) And sure enough, that's what happens. This truck goes through uh, the plate glass windows at the front of the mall. And that's what finally gets Chuck Norris off the door. They T-bone another car. And then a couple of 1980s Karens show up and start bitching at Screech and the henchman in the passenger seat, who are both brandishing weapons. So Screech who's driving this pickup truck that he just hotwired, he reaches out and grabs this blonde-haired white woman by her feathered, frosted dew and just drives off through the mall parking lot with this woman screaming and yelling and banging the side of this truck. It's pretty good. This stunt woman certainly earned her money for this day. Oh my. And then, Bo, who shows up in a late model blue convertible Mustang? Peter Parker Posey. Yeah. And Chuck Norris is just like, get out of the way. It's time to go in hot pursuit. And so they're chasing after this truck with the lady hanging off the side. One of my favorite touches is that they hide the woman's harness as she's hanging on the door as the Uh dude's arm around her. Yeah, that's pretty nice. It's pretty good. I really like that. But they're going like 40 miles an hour. Yeah. The lack of safety that is visible on the screen is shockingly awesome. It's one of the things that makes this movie truly great is that it feels like everything is a little bit more dangerous than it ought to be. These days in movies, Chad, if I can be grandpa for a minute, Uh all of the CGI explosions and CGI people falling off buildings and all that stuff, it's much safer it's probably less expensive at the end of the day but it just looks like garbage in comparison when you watch a movie like this for all its flaws it is actual people doing actual stuff and that makes a difference we're gonna get to it in a minute they almost killed a guy in this yeah movie. they did almost <laughs> kill a guy and it's worth it it looks amazing and it's the they almost killed a guy and they left it in the movie yeah it's a real like ben hur kind of thing you know <laughs> Like, there's a long history in movies of, like, stunt people getting it and keeping that take in the movie. Thank goodness this guy didn't actually die, but... He got close. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly like, (laughs) oh, did that guy just get fucking blown up? Because that's what it looked like. Chuck Norris and Peter Parker posing. They pull up alongside the pickup truck, and the henchman passenger, he starts firing a machine gun at him and they're going full serpentine trying to lose chuck norris and his convertible mustang and chuck norris and peter parker posing they pull up beside the pickup truck to save this woman i appreciate again all of the practical stunt work in this it's fantastic but what's sad is that you don't care about any of the characters in this movie at all we just grab this bitchy woman from the mall parking lot and that's our damsel in distress the henchman at this point pulls out a grenade removes the pin and chuck norris sideswipes the truck the grenade falls to the floor of the truck and then the truck drives into a bunch of parked cars and just blows up r.i.p screech and nameless henchman yeah this is also the scene where we see them spraying bullets at a baseball yeah and when this car goes up by the way Uh uh-huh fucking amazing Again, it's just one of those things where, like, we blew up a real truck and then just threw it at a bunch of other cars, and it's terrific. And blew those cars up. Yeah, it is terrific. So, uh, yeah, I, I love all of this. And then... Peter Parker Posey gets Chuck Norris out of her car. It's like, thanks for the story. And then just takes off because we have no more need for her in this scene. We cut to Rastoff and he's shaking down that asshole from the dive bar. The one what got stabbed in the hand and uh, shot in the hand and chunking the grenade. And 
Rastoff, he throws this injured henchman against the wall and he says, what did Chuck Norris say to you? And the asshole Stooley, he's like, he said to tell you that it's time to die. For, wait, hold on. He said it's time for you to die. For you to die? He said for us to die. It's t- a time Abominable to die. Abominable It's time. It was time after time. No, it's time is money. Opium is money. Then what is time again? <laughs> And then he, he spits in Rostov's face, at which point Rostov just shoots him in the dick a bunch more. <laughs> Which I, I, I've learned to call the Rostov. And then he looks at Nico and is like, see, I told you, we have to keep Chuck Norris. There is no getting around it. And also clean up this man's genitals and pay this man his money. Boss, boss, look, I know you really want to get Chuck Norris. Look, all the guys, they're out in Miami, you know, they're moving on to other cities in America. They're blowing up uh, families at Christmas parties. It's Christmas. Remember, boss, like if we go after Chuck Norris, the whole thing's going to fall apart. All right. And Rostov says, I will do it to myself. And Nico says, look, boss, if you get killed, everything here just goes higgledy piggledy. All right. They listen to you. You're a charismatic leader with the screaming and the yelling and the Russian accent. You're the real deal, buddy. You listen to the original plan of underwhelming democracy you know the experiment that is america we're gonna undo all that shit tease out the fabrics that that remember that thing you was telling me the other night when you was drinking yes i remember thinking we get entire news network devoted to conspiracy theory yes that's you now you're thinking come on you're rest off got the ideas blue sky that's what you are we play it mostly straight during day but at night we get full-blown crazy that's when people watch they watch it. I turn that they do at work doing their fucking shitty jobs. You bring them home at night. You fill their heads with all kinds of fucking crazy ideas and stuff. You make a good point. But first we kill Chuck Norris. All right. Maybe we give Chuck Norris a show. Maybe he's got crazy ideas. Oh, he has crazy ideas. All right. <laughs> so we cut to <laughs> the mall again. That is just yeah. pure chaos. And the cop comes in. And is like, all right, all right. Where the hell is all our backup? And one of his pals, one of the other cops is like, look, a lot of the cops are calling in sick because because they're afraid of all the chaos going on and they want to take care of their families. A bunch of pussies. Also, it don't matter because guess who got called in? The National God. Cut to Chad. Tanks uh-huh. rolling down the streets of suburbia. Uh-huh. Small town USA. Yeah. Along with just trucks full of soldiers. Uh-huh. That scene is like th- of the daytime with the tanks and everything. About eight seconds. And then yeah. we cut to the night where Chuck Norris is driving around seeing roadblocks being set up everywhere. And, you know, all the <laughs> National Guard setting up checkpoints and stuff like that. And then a couple of jeeps block him a military jeeps right but we recognize chad that one of the Do soldiers we? well i did that one of the soldiers <laughs> is one of the cops that shot up the latin dance club and the guy's like yeah we're gonna need to see a little id out of you chuck norris and he goes yes i have id right here in my glove box one second and he leans down and and the guy draws a gun, and so Chuck Norris shoots him before he can get shot. And then he also shoots all of the other soldiers with his Uzis. Think about what happens here. For Chuck Norris in this scene, this is a real soldier. He has no reason to suspect that this person is up to no good. Uh Uh-huh. And when the soldier's like, I need ID, he leans over. It's not unreasonable that a soldier would pull a gun on you if you're reaching down beside the seat in your truck to get your ID. You might be pulling up a gun, which is what he does. And Chuck Norris just kills this guy and then kills all these other dudes around him. He doesn't know that they're bad guys. Well, he knows that they're in his way, and that's all Chuck Norris cares about. (laughs) Like, as we'll learn here in a minute, he is just using government institutions to get the shit he needs done. He doesn't actually care about them. All right. After murdering all these people in the streets, we- Are we still in Miami? Uh, ish, I guess. I don't know. I don't know where we are. I mean, it looks like we're in, I don't know, like Murfreesboro or- Or Brooklyn. I mean, it could be anywhere. Uh, Yeah, like- A lot of it looks like New York, but he ends up finding the Asian dude- and who is still alive, just bleeding to death. And he says, hey, punk, do you feel like talking? And the Asian dude just screams at him. So Chuck Norris just shoots him about 37 times with his Uzi and kills him. Right. And then he goes to the next guy and says, what about you? Do you feel like talking? And the guy's like, okay, okay, I'll talk. So he gets information, one presumes, about Rostov. We never really get any of that. And then we hear a voice declaring martial law is coming to this city. 
Is that from the helicopter that's yeah. flying overhead? Yes. All citizens should stay off the streets. And this family, like a couple and their daughter, are kind of skirting the shadows, presumably where Chuck Norris dwells. Mm-hmm. They're headed to church. And Rostov and his goons are also out on the streets at night. And we see this family make it into the church. Well, they knock on the door and the door's locked. Well, like all churches, you have to know the code. It's like mm. two times, pause, and then a third. And then they let you in. The guy slides back the whole side. Yeah. It's like, peace be with you. And also with you. <laughs> yeah. Lucky guess. They do the ghost dog where it's in power and equality, my brother. Always see everything. All right, come in. Who's your favorite character in the Bible? Jesus. Mm, lucky yes old testament or new testament that's ah, your question only the new testament counts and anyway <laughs> they make it into the church <laughs> and it's almost full inside there and meanwhile outside one of these goons is setting up explosives uh, and wiring it up at the doors of the church it's a real dum 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 Dum, 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 dum. It's like Wiley e. Coyote. The way he sits down the suitcase with the C4 and then spooling it back. Do, 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 do. It's pretty good. <laughs> and then, so Nico and Rostov are there. Of course. Right. They micromanage everything, Bo. Up to the culmination, because at a certain point, Nico is like, uh, hey, boss, we uh, we got to take off. And Rostov is like, okay, I think these guys have it from here. They already have wire run, bomb by door. We're going to go micromanage elsewhere. Let me see detonator. Is it in off position? Light is flashing red. Now, what will you do to make bomb explode? Ah, uh, gee, boss, we're going to flip it up. That is right. Flip it up once, bomb will explode, all right? Uh, repeat back to me. We're going to flip it up once, boss. Very good, all right? Once you have done that, send me a message on my pager. Remember, this movie is in late 80s. I think pagers exist at this time. If not, send it to giant cellular telephone in my car it is about the size of encyclopedia britannica and has antenna as long as my forearm so send it to that if that does not work go down to local kinkos and fix me message to let me know that you have activated the bomb and blown up christians at christmas time you know what you have this you've got it i'm being paranoid you got it i told my sister i will give your son job you have job so nephew you you will definitely make this happen and make me proud to make your uh, mother proud make the family proud if you screw this up i'll shoot you in the dick yeah we'll get the rust <laughs> off and so they take off hymns are happening inside the building they wire up the bomb the goon flips the switch nothing happens chad it's all oh quiet. shit he's gonna get shot in the dick bro yeah, he's like oh man i loved my testicles too and then <laughs> chuck norris shows up above them on a building or something uh-huh. and says hey boys are you missing this and tosses down this bomb <laughs> And he says, let me guess, it didn't work. Now it will. And he just touches a couple of wires together and hot wires this bomb and it explodes, presumably killing these dudes. Yeah. It's fascinating how much of this movie isn't in this movie. Like he just shows up out of nowhere to do a thing. Yeah. But they don't explain any of that. It's one of the things that is both best and worst about this. Agreed. Because uh, on the one hand, I don't need to see all the details because I don't really care that much. Sure. But on the other hand, the narrative lover in me is like, so how did he know that this was happening? Oh, I guess he just happens to be wandering the neighborhood like the Batman and saw that trouble was afoot. But whatever. We cut to a local market where a grocery store owner is holding a small bullhorn and he's shouting at at this crowd of like 18 people uh, because of deteriorating citation on the highways you're only gonna be allowed to have 12 items from my store at a time so choose wise if you need steak or toilet paper or beans or charcoal briquettes i got some really nice pornography behind the counter if you're interested uh and a couple few bottles of rides up to you but only 12 items per customer also eerily prescient about supply chain problems in the face of chaos. Peter Parker Posey is taking pictures of this crowd while all this rationing announcements being made. Uh-huh. And then some soldiers show up, presumably. Yep. 
but it turns out that it's Nico and a bunch of his goons. Yep. And they start going after the crowd and whatnot. And Chuck Norris shows up because of his Spidey sense tingling. Sure. Again, like Batman. Yeah. So Chuck Norris starts shooting some of these terrorist soldiers. And then the grocers, who, by the way, have shotguns. Yeah. <laughs> they start sh- firing at him, too. It's like a Western style shootout, Bo. They drop to one knee and it's like, boom, boom. It's terrific. Then Nico grabs Peter Parker Posey as a hostage and is yelling for Chuck Norris to show himself because he has slipped back into the shadows. Uh huh. And then Chuck Norris appears from behind him somehow. Yep. And grabs his gun and in a real like, why are you hitting yourself kind of moment, he just makes the dude shoot himself in the head. Yep. And then just strolls away. His work is done. Peter Parker Posey is running after him. And and it's like, you almost got me killed. And she tries to smack him, but his innate karate skills kick in and he blocks uh-huh. it. And she's like, ow, you almost broke my hand. And he's like, well, looks like you are mad at me. I'm going to get in this Jeep and leave now. And that's what he does. And end of scene. Chuck Norris was the one who read all those ninja magazines. He wrote them. He had guest articles. <laughs> Like, that's when I, you knew it was going to be good. It's like, and a special article from... A guest editor. As the fabric of the American society is falling apart one thread at a time, all of the children of our movie are put on school buses to be sent somewhere? They're being sent, like, to a farm upstate where they can run and play or something. Are you ready for the summer? Are you ready for the good time? The bus rolls by, a guy sleeping in a tree. Are you ready? for the birds and bees the skies and trees and a whole lot of fooling around no more teachers <laughs> no more v- you meatball it's weird that they use the name of the movie meatballs in the movie that is one of those that you didn't need you know like if you're calling your movie x-men you want to hear somebody say x-men at some point you name your movie meatballs ah, i don't need anybody to say meatballs in the movie that's just me though i don't know why that movie was called meatballs i don't know maybe at some point that was like a canadian Canadian slang term for goofballs or something maybe mm. i don't know anyway yeah so these kids are being sent upstate where they can run and play yep and kids are singing row 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 your boat on this thing. it's a haunting version of row 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 your boat in round yeah it's like they're on their way to a death camp <laughs> yeah it's a real life is beautiful kind of ending <laughs> and then a, a, a car full of banditos pulls up alongside this bus and they just put a like a sticky bomb on the side of it uh-huh. with a countdown timer running it's running a lot faster than you would think a countdown timer would go oh yes it's really trucking it's the kind of countdown you know when people are disarming a bomb where it's going at normal second speed and then they clip the wrong wire and then it just goes like, yeah. oh shit we're all gonna die it's starts there yes luckily though Bo chuck norris it turns out is on the same interstate with this bus of children with a bomb on the side of it and by the way he didn't see any of this happen but he instinctively knows to speed up beside the bus and he reaches out and just plucks the bomb off the bus heads up to the henchmen banditos in their car he tosses it over it sticks to their car and he quips did you lose this and then drives off and then their car explodes yeah naturally and so later for no good reason he is just touring an amusement park dude it's a traveling carnival <laughs> like the one that pops up in parking lots or county fairs yeah it but he walks past rides and game booths and he eventually stops where it looks like a merry-go-round or like a ride with cars that goes in a circle has just burned to the ground and i think that the filmmakers just stumbled across this tragedy and decided to interject it as part of their narrative of terrorists destroying american life as we know it for sure this is definitely a hey what do we have access to kind of production robert rodriguez making lemonade out of lemons moment for sure and it turns out that there is some wreckage at the alpine or something and (laughs) cia agent adams sneaks up behind chuck norris the one who hired him earlier and he says congratulations on taking nico out and chuck norris says for everyone i stop 100 succeed next time it will be the ferris wheel or the tilt a whirl here are some instructions that i've written on white pieces of loose leaf paper do what is on this paper and you should also think about the stakes if we do not do what is on these pieces of paper the cia agent is like 
think of the risks if we do this crazy plan of yours that we haven't revealed and he says think of the risks think of the stakes and that's when he leaves and so then we see some news crews moving among the military as like an all-out state of emergency is taking place in the streets we're in atlanta though because the reporter says i i'm tracy reporter here in atlanta georgia where the military is setting up a command center for the finale of the movie and so Rostov is watching this news report while meanwhile Chuck Norris is watching Earth versus the Flying Saucers on his television. Uh, Shows you where yeah. his head's at. What can I say? I really like the work of Ray Harryhausen. <laughs> It was unusual for stop motion to be employed on these flying saucer effects, but it's quite effective. And then this cop shows up with all of his deputies and whatnot going after Chuck Norris in his hotel room where he's watching Earth versus the Flying Saucer. It's like the end of Christmas vacation. It's all a bit too much. And also, I think we're still in Miami. I think that's where Chuck Norris is because they bust in and they grab him and then they're going to extradite him to atlanta where something is happening like a meeting of all of the important people or something so that's part of the setup i presume that chuck norris has coordinated because that's one of the things that the cia agent says is that uh, like there are all these different departments that we have to coordinate with nobody's ever done anything like this so i think the idea is that chuck norris sets himself up so that the cop gets wind of where he is meanwhile there is also this report about all these leaders of the country getting together in the area so that they can work out all this crazy terrorism that's going on and also in the same building at the same time they are taking chuck norris into custody do you think he orchestrated that UHF station showing Earth versus the Flying Saucers as part of his plan? Like, was that on the loose leaf paper? Like, step one, get Earth versus the Flying Saucers to air at 8 p.m. Eastern on local UHF station 42. And then, like, step two, me watching Earth versus the Flying Saucers while chilling with my sleeveless denim shirt unbuttoned, showing off my ripped core in the room with a glorious mullet and a neatly trimmed beard. I think that was a little treat yourself you know <laughs> i'm like hey i'm about to get into some real business soon i'm gonna watch a, a movie i enjoy before that happens i can appreciate that yeah yeah he is it, the canadian tuxedo that he is wearing for much of this movie is truly breathtaking rostov is watching multiple tvs at once and he's getting all of his information on how the stock market is tanking and how the media is helping to spread violent behavior in america not unlike how the former president of the united states spent most of his days one news channel Channel says a vigilante in Miami was arrested. We don't know his name, but he's being transported to a top secret facility in Atlanta for the finale of this movie. And also, here's the address. And so, as he's being marched into custody, helicopters are flying overhead, dropping leaflets that Peter Parker Posey sees that say that there is a curfew now in effect to keep more actors off of the street because we only have so much in the budget for extras. So let's keep it down. This is isn't world war ii Bo. like we're not in the 40s or some undeveloped part of the world hearts and minds man hearts and minds why are they dropping leaflets on downtown atlanta they got tv and radio and newspapers i don't think <laughs> dropping flyers from the sky is the best way to get information out to people in the year 1985 or 86 whenever the hell this took place you know who needs leaflets old coots you have to get the old coot demographic and they are never going to watch tv or listen to the radio because of all the uh radio waves being used to penetrate their brain but they'll pick up loose floating around pieces of paper what just here oh my god curfew i gotta get back inside right and there's no dates on it like how long does this last for forever oh shit <laughs> <laughs> until question mark peter parker posey has made her way to atlanta for the finale of the film she's got a press pass that gets her anywhere she wants to go she's like a ghost yeah and a tv station cameraman is following chuck norris on his perp walk and a reporter says chuck norris is there anything you want to say on live tv and chuck norris looks in the camera and he says nico rossetti now it's your turn I'm like wait what? One night you will close your eyes and I'll be there and it will be time to die. And I'm like, I don't think you saying this on live TV is a good idea because inevitably a lot of what's going on here is going to find its way to a courtroom. Yeah. 
And all of this footage is going to help refute the long list of felonies that are going to be charged against Chuck Norris. Like, it's not going to work in his favor. Either that or it's going to play into an insanity defense, something fierce. Fair enough. You know, we see Rostov watching. Well, he's not this. happy, Bo. And as soon as he sees this, he's just like, I am so sick of him making fun of me in public like this. And then destroys the TV. Uh-huh. And he tells a pair of nearby goons, because all the good ones are dead now. Screech is dead. Nico's dead. He's down to Noodles, Big T, Little T. That's all he's got left. Look, I want you to get all remaining terrorists. We go to go all in we're pushing everything into pot i want every single terrorist at this place we are going to kill chuck norris and also all of the government people that are coming together to solve this terrorism problem so kind of win-win for me we both get government problem which helps invasion usa and we also kill chuck norris who is real thorn inside We cut to a parking garage where some security guards, two of them, are hanging out with a mechanic. And it is here that there is a shot from behind one of the security guards facing the garage door. And this garage door explodes inward. And this is where they almost killed a guy. Because the guard is played by stuntman Max Maxwell, Mm -hmm. friend of Chris Christopherson. (laughs) And he was told when he took this role that there would be an explosion and that the garage door was going to collapse. But instead, the explosion was so awesome, it just blows this steel door to smithereens, sending debris flying all over the place. Maxwell was hit by debris. He suffered a fractured forearm, a lacerated forehead, bruised knee, and numerous cuts, and was unable to work for three months worth it you get to see that when you watch this yeah it is shocking when it happens you're like oh my god they blew that guy up it's something and yeah and then all these armored vans are stolen from this place and, Uh and filled with terrorists along with just a couple of trucks too it's like you've got three or four armored vans and then just the back of a pickup for everybody else like the real b team terrorists show up in that one maybe that's for all the claustrophobic terrorists Right. Like, I can't get inside an armored vehicle. I just, I can't breathe. I start to have panic attacks. Put me inside. Oh, outdoors. Okay, this is good. This is good. I can handle this. And Rostov, meanwhile, has an actual helicopter. And so he and <laughs> some of his pals take off in that. Then they reach this headquarters. And as soon as they bust into this place, there is an honest-to-goodness, just small-scale war going on as the National Guard shows up and starts doing battle with these knuckleheads from rostov's army there's not much of a military presence and we will later find out why that's the case because they just kind of hop 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 run in yeah and they're just spraying bullets all around but there's not a lot of resistance which seems to be a bit of a clue that something is awry yeah there are more people in the windows of nearby high rises watching the filming of this movie below than there are people fighting back against the terrorists up top on the roof of this place rostov and his goons have landed Mm -hmm. and they blow the lock off the door at the roof and they head inside and so it's a real like you guys start at the bottom we'll start at the top meet in the middle and then we're going to kill everybody right that's when below you see tanks and helicopters from the national guard start rolling in and then like a bat from the night chuck norris shows up out of the shadows with a grenade launcher on the roof of this place how did he get there i don't know just there and then he just fires this grenade launcher at the helicopter blows it up it's awesome it's great blows him up like a giant grizzly bear and then rostov's men meanwhile are going through the building shooting up everything inside but it turns out like hey nobody's around They make their way to a movie set that looks like an office building. Uh They bust down the doors of each office one by one, and they just like spray their bullets. Nobody's there. It's empty. And then Rastoff steps and says, wait a minute. That son of a bitch. It is a trap like Return of Jedi. We have been tricked. Outside, the men on the terrorist side of things are just looking way overwhelmed because it is just soldiers and tanks and helicopters as far as the eye can see. So Rostov and his men head back up to the roof. But surprise, surprise, Chuck Norris is waiting for him up there and starts shooting at him. So they run back inside and go 
downstairs. Shit, cheat, cheat, cheat. Soldiers on the ground, Chuck Norris on the roof. We are in the real pickle, friends. He is like a Batman. How did he even get up there? So <laughs> Chuck Norris now is on the hunt. As he is going through this office building set, one dude pops out from behind a cubicle. <laughs> Yeah, like you're playing lethal enforcers, and he just no looks. This guy just shoots him with his Uzi, kicks another dude in the face, and Uzi's him. Yeah. And then shoots a couple of more dudes with Uzis, and then all of a sudden he's out of bullets. And also, down on the street, tanks and National Guard and military are just laying waste to the what 250 shitheads that have decided to take over america it's a slaughter inside though chuck norris has to go with one of the goons leftover guns which has like an underneath grenade launcher or something sure and that sounds awesome yeah then he reaches a point where he's trying to get the remaining two goons who aren't rostov and they're waiting for him on either side of a door so he does this trick shot or something where he fires real fast a couple of times and blows a hole through both walls beside the door and shoots those guys but when he goes in to check his math one of the guys is still alive and is going for his gun so chuck norris just throws a knife and stabs him from a distance take that mm -hmm. And then Rostov shows up with his machine gun and is like, it is time for you to die. See, you are going to do it to me, but no, no, I'm going to kill you, Chuck Norris. And then it's a real like <laughs> cat and mouse thing through the hallways between Chuck Norris and this dude. It's so boring. Rostov is just firing bullets. Brrr, and then Chuck Norris uses childlike gymnastics to escape all of this gunfire. He's like doing somersaults uh -huh. and cartwheels and sad backhands springs that don't really land quite right and then rostov goes into a room looking for chuck norris and then chuck norris uses his secret move of jumping from the shadows <laughs> and he tosses rostov over his shoulder and now we get some of that sweet chuck norris martial arts that we paid top dollar to see bo and there's a couple of roundhouse kicks to rostov who recovers pretty quickly and then chuck norris poof he disappears and rostov he runs to an office where he finds, of course, a grenade launcher. Mm -hmm. And then, again, down on the streets, the military is just taking care of this ragtag group of terrorists. And they're like, USA, USA. And then Rastoff, he's being all stealthy and he's slowly working his way through the halls of this fake office building set with his grenade launcher. And then behind him, Bo, Chuck Norris sneaks up behind Rastoff and Chuck Norris pulls out his own collapsible grenade launcher and he says, it's time. Yeah, and Rastoff is like, what the, that sounds so bland. This is last line of movie, and you really, oh, you have grenade launcher. Oh, boy. And so Chuck Norris <laughs> fires his grenade launcher, which leads to this awesome moment where Rostov is blown to bits and out a window. Uh-huh. There's a lot of fire. We see a cosmetology practice mannequin head mm -hmm. fall out this flaming window. And then, in typical fashion for a movie like this, Chad, Chuck Norris just throws down the grenade launcher and credits what happened to peter parker posey don't matter what about the cop who cares what about his cia friend who gives a shit this movie's done we blew up the villain let's all go home that's how it ends that's I it love it yeah <laughs> from explosion of villain to credits is what nine seconds ten i was gonna say about four yeah it's like boom credits it's terrific and so that is invasion usa the best movie we will talk about this season i think you're right I is it good no is it ridiculously entertaining absolutely you know what's crazy is that chuck norris is so it's not even bland it's like when you watch a cut of a movie that doesn't have the finished special effects in it <laughs> and it's like oh we're gonna add this in later it's like they made this whole movie and they were like oh we're gonna cgi in the hero of the movie later and he'll be charismatic and funny and you'll be engaged and you'll want to see him succeed in the end this is just to fill in the gaps while you watch all the other nonsense that's going on it's quite good like he is i like the idea of him just being a placeholder actor like <laughs> yeah he can deliver karate kicks he just can't deliver a line 
And the best role that he ever had was as like the evil Kung Fu guy from those Bruce Lee movies and stuff where he yeah. didn't have to act. He just had to be a, a fighter. And he's a, like, right. he's a great stunt man and he's a great martial artist and all that stuff. He's just whatever the opposite of charismatic is. He is that he makes you fall asleep listening to him talk. Yeah, it's not a great movie, no. but it may be the greatest movie we watch this whole season. Well, and here's the thing. As goofy as it all is, the stunts are terrific. It does hum along, even though it's like an hour and 45 minutes. It trucks like there as little as happens like you're constantly moving from scene to scene you're not lingering too long you know joseph yeah. zito is not a steven spielberg but he knows how to put a movie <laughs> together and i would argue this movie is like a million times more entertaining than fucking war horse so point to joe zito if you ask me <laughs> <laughs> but he also we mentioned this even on the last episode but he was the guy who directed friday the 13th part four which is the best of the friday the 13th movies absolutely and so the guy can put together a good genre movie is he gonna end up in you know the academy of motion picture arts and sciences no of course he's not but am i going to watch a joe zito movie again absolutely i will i think that chuck norris is like one of those people that may be on the mount rushmore of 80s action heroes you know you've got stallone you've got schwarzenegger there were a lot of people that fall into this sort of iconic type of movie character and during the 80s there were a lot of these movies with action hero superstars that were invincible one-man armies that were filled with no vulnerabilities but it wasn't until Bo, the release of a little movie called die hard Ooh, the famous christmas that movie. all of yeah. that changed that's right and in the next episode our season finale of pick six movies we will be taking on what is arguably the most famous christmas adjacent movie ever made sequel die hard to die harder that's right a movie that so desperately wants to be lethal weapon 2 that you kind of feel bad for <laughs> Oh, wait, this is the one with William Sadler naked. Uh-huh, in a Motel 6 or a La Quinta. Uh-huh, all right. That's the one. Yeah. Uh-huh. I remember that yeah. not being very good. And, and JJ's dad shows up to blow things up. Oh, that's right. Uh-huh. Oh, boy. And then we get Urkel's next door neighbor for a cameo, because he's not needed in it. It has been a very long time since I've seen this movie, and, and the more you say, the less I want to watch it again. Well, unfortunately, you're going to have to watch it, and it is not good. It does not hold up well, and not since Home Alone 2 have you seen a Christmas-adjacent movie that desperately rips off its predecessor, beat for beat, note for note, as much as Die Hard 2 does. It is off. Well, at least it's the finale. <laughs> So come back and see us in two weeks' time. As always, like, rate, review. You can reach out to us at picksixmovies at gmail.com. Tell a friend, tell a neighbor. If you're listening to this on Christmas Eve, when it lands, Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Please don't set anyone's Christmas trees on fire, regardless of what national news network they are supporting. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on Invasion USA, the Chuck Norris debut here at Pick 6 Movies? We almost saw a guy die on screen. Yes, we did. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone.